Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Thank Good you evening. for um, this opportunity. Uh, my name is Eric Young, and I am a member of the Philadelphia Ethical Society and um, and um, a longtime member, a community activist, I would call myself, and um, a member of the Black Panther Party, um, and which uh, I'm going to do a, a, a more longer program. But tonight, thanks, Ron asked me to talk about um, Mumia Abu-Jamal, um, to give a run through in the Black Panther Party, so I hope to uh, do this justice. I let me start with, I guess, a timeline. There was so much stuff that, that's happening. Um, I want to start with um, uh, the Black Panther Party and come up to Mamiya. Mamiya was a member of the Black Panther Party. Um, the timeline, of course, I guess, is that the Black Panther Party was founded in October of 1967 uh, in Oakland, California. Um, and by Bobby Seale and uh, Huey P. Newton. Um, and it was to fight, I, I don't know, without going too much, Oakland, California is pretty much, um, Oakland at that time was, was a heavily, um, uh, was poor, um, influenced with, with cops that they had, the police force were kind of recruited from the South with the purpose of pretty much a, a kind of a police state. But there was a lot of resistance, um, the black community was, was fairly um, politicized. Um, and again, we had the free spirit of the Bay Area and that kind of thing. And that's where I grew up in San Francisco, not too far from Oakland. And one of the first things that attracted uh, myself and another young black man was the image of um, these um, tall, uh, kind of stoic uh, black men um, intimidating the police and you know Black Panther Party um, when we saw them they had they had the leather uh, they weren't smiling they were serious and they also were armed and they intimidated the police because they followed the police around on their nightly things on their nightly routines where they would harass people or stop people and particularly people of color and all of a sudden these armed men come and says oh, we're going to monitor to make sure that you don't abuse people's rights and the image of that is what got me because if you had never seen black men um, with that kind of resistance and that kind of fervor, and um, and it was just an amazing kind of sight. And it, but they also encouraged um, the community to begin to um, take care of themselves. The community also to reverse a lot of discrimination. Um, to kind of give you an idea of programs that, and most people, you know, of course, the police. Um, and, I'm sorry, FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, um, at one point called the Black Panther Party the greatest threat to national security. Not the KKK, not the White Citizens Council, but the Black Panther Party for self-defense was considered the greatest threat to security. Most of what I did, I joined the party, uh, the Panther Party at the age of 15. Um, and most of what we did, just to kind of give you an idea of the programs that we did. We had the first, um, we fed young children who were going to school hungry um, with a breakfast program um, that had to go on uh, no matter what happened in, on the national scene and all the other stuff. Um, we also, um, we had a, clean, a free clothing program. Um, we protected elderly people who were being uh, victims of, of, snur of purse snatching and robbery. We escorted them to trips to the supermarket. We escorted them to the doctor's office and this kind of thing. So these young men, um, and again, it was legal to be armed in Oakland, so that's, that, and that's great. So that was, it was perfectly legal. Um, and. So they did those kind of programs. We had a free health, we developed a free health clinic. At that time, sickle cell anemia was running um, rampant. Um, we educated people about their health and, and how to um, take charge of their health. Um, we also uh, published a newspaper, um, which came out every month, called The, the Panther Speaks, um, which we sold on the street corner. And that was one of the first, that was the first job I had. That helped support us and helped support the party. Um, and we also just, uh, and again, whatever, whatever communities, communities came up with ideas or something to, um, to help us out or whenever there was trouble. So the Black Panther Party was there to then support, to listen to the community and find out what kind of programs that we had. Um, the Panther Party grew um, at an extreme rate. And at one point, there were more than, um, ah, okay. I had to find this on the internet, but these are Panther chapters and branches that is spread from the West Coast to East Coast. Um, there were, um, considering it was, the national headquarters was in Oakland, there were uh, Richmond and Boston, the party spread to Chicago, Denver, Indianapolis, uh, New York, of course, Harlem, Brooklyn, uh, Staten Island had their own, uh, New Haven, Connecticut, 
um, Seattle, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Cleveland, Detroit, Washington, D.C., Winston-Salem. There were international chapters as well. Um, there was one in Algeria. There was a Japanese chapter of the Black Panther Party support group. Scandinavian had a support group. And Paris, France, to give you an idea. So, um, and there was a national, uh, in 1969, there was a United Front Against Fascism conference in Oakland, California. Um, while the Black Panther Party was for people of African descent, we also encouraged the white community to build support groups and support groups that worked in poor and working class white areas as the best contribution. And again, there were also there was the Great Panthers, as some some of you might have remember a woman named Maggie Cohn, mm -hmm. who started a Great Panther close chapter. Friend. Pardon me. She was a close friend. Oh yeah, and I one, of, Maggie Cohn too. one of the great people, um, one of the most dead. magnetic and great. Um, human beings I had the pleasure of meeting. So we worked, and again, so they were encouraged. Them. There was a Puerto Rican group called the Puerto Rican Workers Organization here in Philadelphia. That was a, a similar to the chapter, path of thing. Um, there were celebrities that joined our cause. Um, Leonard Bernstein, uh, Marlon Brando, um, and uh, there were others who contributed some behind the scenes. Um, believe it or not, um, this is one of the ironies of it, but a young Charlton Heston also was part of the civil rights movement and was interested. Um, wow. Later in life, of course, he kind of made one step <laughs> too much. But so we also had people like that. Um, Danny Glover was a member of the, uh, Shaka Khan was a member of the Panther Party. So um, the Panther Party and I was when I came to the East Coast, we li living in Philadelphia, I joined the Panther Party here, and it was at 2925 Columbia Avenue, which is now Cecil B. Moore Avenue. Um, it was called the Black United Front, and after spending time in Washington D.C. and spending time in Baltimore chapter. Um, the Panther Party would send people like uh, myself and kind of others to, I went to New Haven, Connecticut to work on the Bobby Seal trial. Um, as you know, in 1968, the Chicago 7, um, I guess people are familiar with that, but Bobby Seal was in New Haven. So I was sent to work with the, um, the student population in um, New Haven and also went to Hartford and Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, I was sent, the Panther Party sent me to Tallahassee, Florida to work with students at Florida A. ANU, um, we were my first time down south and working with working class people and who were the most generous um, people who really, I mean their houses were on stilts to, you know, um, to avoid flooding. They really were um, just poor working class with the hospitality and generosity. And um, we also had uh, PE classes, we had political education classes. So we took young students who the, the school district had given up on that they weren't going to learn. And we were teaching them about um, the movement, about their history, um, about political education. Mo the, the Panther Party considered itself a Marxist-Leninist uh, organization. Um, and that's where I learned about it. You know, um, you know, we grew up with the philosophy that Marxism should be taught as, as other philosophies. Um, and it was legitimate. And, and thing. So we had this world of looking at the world in, in, a, in a communal way, in an international way. Um, one of the, um, let me see what else I did. Uh, I looked at, one of the first things that we did was that, um, that surprised a lot of people was that uh, Jimmy Newton had a, gave a speech in 1970 and the need to support um, the women's liberation movement which was starting to grow. And the gay liberation movement, one of the, fir one of the first and maybe the only organ uh, organization, and it, really, it was such a controversial statement even within our, our members. And again, we, you know, the Panther Party worked with, um, uh, working class and poor um, young men who you know, had all the patriarchal and the sexist ideas. So to come out with this statement that that the support for that, um, despite whatever your personal things about homosexuality, that it was still they were oppressed people, they were seen as an oppressed force, the same as women, and that you had to su submerge your personal thing and not be intimidated by the idea of. And he laid it out. It was pretty. Bold fourth day, says people may be worried. He told these young men, "Are you worried? Are you against homosexuality because you fear you might be homosexual?" And he said that these things you got as a revolutionary, you got to find a way to um, to get over it. It was a very a lot of guys did not appreciate that, um, as you know. Um, and and again, at that time, of course, the country was not as gay friendly, if I may use that term. That, but it was a revolutionary act, um, and really just kind of put it out there. It was the one the first. Because most of the civil rights groups were heavily male, um, uh, even the best of them. Women, as you know, the night, to give you an idea, in 1963, the, the march on, at this, 
the March on Washington, there was only one woman that was allowed to speak of all the civil rights. And I, um, Rosa Parks was supposed to speak, and then at the last minute, they. So all these organizations were heavily um, male um, led, and the Panther Party was the, the first and, ma and a major civil rights organization to be head by a woman. Her name was Elaine Brown. When the, when FB, when the FBI and uh, Co um, COINTELPRO was designed to crush the Panther Party. Um, so they, they said agents, particularly black um, cops and agents, to infiltrate these groups and to, to you know, dissension within as well as to set them up. And of course the police started to shoot uh, unarmed members of the Black Panther Party. They would throw bombs um, into Panther headquarters. Um, and remember now, there were children involved, there were families involved with a lot of these bombs, and of course they were blamed on, on Panther enemies, but it was really the FBI. Uh, remember, the FBI, is, as, as Hoover said, we were the, num the Panther Party was the number one threat to national security of the United States. Um, so that was the war, and that's, again, so a lot of the men were either jailed and, uh, you know, um, was shot at or were in exile. Hubie Newton went to Cuba and to China and some other places. So women had to take up, as always, the slack. So Elaine Brown was, was elected to be the, you know, the total, uh, she was totally in charge of the Black Panther Party. Um, and a lot of brothers couldn't deal with that. Um, so they left or they, you know, they talked bad about it. She was a no-nonsense community activist who was still a community activist in Oakland, um, still fighting police brutality, still fighting that. Um, and it was a pleasure to be a, um, you know, a member um, you know, um, under the leadership of Elaine Brown. So when in Philadelphia, I joined the Black Panther Party where I, um, for, um, the Black United Front, it was called here. Again, a small group. Um, we were on, uh, like I said, Columbia Avenue. Um, and we dealt with, um, and I was also a member, um, one of the, one of the uh, I guess the talents that I had was that I was also comfortable around um, mostly white organizations or white groups. So that was part of my thing is that I did, you know, um, was to help be the, the party liaison among a number of these support groups. Um, and uh, of course, we, the Temple Free Press was um, organized and uh, supported by a, um, a couple from Toronto, Judy and Bill Biggins, uh, who, were, who were revolutionaries and again, white. So we, we were the first ones to, um, one of our main publications was a, a pamphlet called Rizzo and the Police State that every news organization, every news, not, they won't admit it, but they borrowed because our, our, um, our research was impeccable. We documented how Rizzo um, would meet every Monday, just to give you an idea, with Angela Bruno, head of the mob here. It was, we had, you know, we documented the, the, at the room at the airport where they met, where he got his marching orders. Um, and, you know, of course, Angela Bruno, the quiet Don, but still, Rizzo got up through the rank over people who were more qualified because he was working for the, for the mob. And um, so we documented that. We documented Rizzo getting payoffs from, from uh, gambling and this kind of thing. So Rizzo and the police, they also documented the, that the, uh, the police force, um, again, would beat up um, uh, particularly uh, people of color. Um, there was a case where a man named Martha Davis, um, he's upstairs in his home on the second floor. And this man was in his 50s. He's a you know, nice working class, quiet guy, didn't bother anybody. Um, the police were raiding his home by mistake, thinking it was a drug thing. So they, so they, no, no, so they barge up the room, all, about 50 armed cops are barging up this narrow steps and that. So he hears this noise and thinking that, you know, he's being robbed by drug dealers. Of course, the police had never come around with the drug dealers. So Arthur, uh, um, Arthur Davis uh, is armed, and he starts shooting down there. They didn't identify themselves. And of course, after a five hour thing, you know, they shot him a number, fortunately they didn't kill him, but they wounded him and took him out, beat him and arrested him. So we documented that, and that started the whole thing of the, of the police um, there. One of the journalists at this time was a young man formerly called Wesley Cook, and uh, who changed his name to Mamiya Abu Jamal, uh, one of the leading journalists in this city. Um, and I had to play, and he was teaching as a member of the Panther Party. He joined the Panther Party at 14. Um, and he worked with WHAT and WRD and other news services. He became one of the an excellent journalist, a photojournalist, and you know his commentaries were um, uh, circulated around the country. And he also started teaching young people like myself um, about journalism, how to be better, and to be um, community journalists, and how to record events. 
and this kind. Of, so that was the first time I met him, a dynamic, charismatic, but also a very, um, everything he talked about was never, not so much about himself as town as he was, but it was always, again, for um, other people, other people less, um, that we had, that those who were privileged enough to have knowledge over the college had to go back into the community and, and teach, you know, um, others. And that was part of the, also part of the, the Panther values. So I had the opportunity to meet him and I learned from him about that. And to go on, um, well, the Panther Party um, didn't last long. I mean, the Cohen, Cohen Tell Pro helped to, um, uh, of course, a lot of people, as you know, Fred Hampton and Mark Clark in Chicago were um, one of the most brilliant um, men in terms of an organizing community activist is Fred Hampton. Um, you couldn't have asked for a better um, uh, person. Of course, the police um, unarmed shot him and killed him and Mark Clark. And you just had these shootings that were going on and, um, throughout. So uh, the Panther chapters, uh, a lot of them, uh, again, uh, people were burned out. Um, uh, you know, um, quite a few members were in exile. So the Panther Party ended, um, and I technically about 82, although again, some chapters um, lasted on. But I think the values of the Panther Party and, and the things that are going on, um, but so I, and that part of it, and I wanted to, um, oh, uh, just to kind of show you um, how widespread and some of the things we were, one of the things we did, a Panther member who is still alive was named Emery Douglas, who was a great artist. And he also was talking about revolutionary art. Um, and uh, just how important it is for any movement to have artists who, um, you know, who, showca who showcase the struggles of that, um, of that movement. And I did, of course, I had some things just to pass around to kind of give you an idea. To kind of, some of it, and again, the Panthers, are, as you know, are not pacifists. I mean, they believed self-defense, and armed self-defense was a right of everybody. Um, while they were also, again, were peace that, um, you know, our ultimate aim is peace, but they were not um, nonviolent in terms of Dr. King's thing. They believed that everybody had the right for self-defense. And that when, you know, when you're coming up against an, um, an enemy that is using self-defense, you had the right to defend your family. Um, so this, I would, you know, these are kind of the, the artwork of Henry Douglas. And of course, our, our known symbol um, is uh, one of the great symbols. And this was, the, this was, Directed by them and kind of did that. And the whole idea of the panther was that they looked for an animal that didn't, um, despite its reputation, that didn't attack unless it was provoked. But once it was provoked, you know, um, things. So Emory Douglas was also taking young artists who may have been doing graffiti on the wall and telling them that they had to turn their talents to, um, you know, to more community activist things. So again, as you see, some of these are, you know, um, again, working people and people, poor people, again, but, um, building things and protecting their um, investment. So uh, I wanted the, that history of the. Um, I was looking for a picture of me as a um, as a Panther member, just to kind of. And then I realized um, I was not supposed to have my picture taken. Um, there was a number of people who were not because of the, the police surveillance. I mean, and, and um, you know, maybe because when they found out, they would trace it back to your family, and you might you might have a brother who was picked up, and this happened quite a lot. So you may, they may not come after you, you were protected, but they would go after your brother or sister, harass them on the street, pick them up, and then say, you know, do you have you know, some stuff in the back, and this kind of thing. Um, the only thing I could say in full off was that I know that they, um, they came to ask my father, um, a police guard in 1971, Frank Von Collin was a park guard, was um, shot and killed. Um, so Rizzo told the police, well, just arrest any black guy within the um, uh, ranges of 18 to 45. And, and they had carte blanche to do that. So I wasn't around, I'm not sure where I was. So they went to ask my father where I was and that, you know, um, we think your son was involved with this. Did you know your son was involved in this? So my father just, you know, um, God rest his soul. But he's laid back and he says, well, I don't know where my son is, but uh, I wouldn't tell you anyway. And, yeah, so, <laughs> so I didn't find that out until later. And, um, you know, so, um, so that was my history. And again, um, you know, it's, it's been more than 50 years and I had to like think back. So I wasn't supposed to have my picture taken. Um, but I think this is me, only just to kind of, <laughs> well, my back turned. So again, I couldn't find any pictures of me, thank goodness. I kept that pledge. 
Uh, but again, a lot of us were, were like that, that we were not, I'm the one with the back turn. I think that's me, I'm not sure. Um, so I don't know. But I had a big afro and, and um, you know. And uh, so Mumia at Bu Jamal, I mean, and specifically um, as Ron asked me to do, I have the time, um, a timeline, there's so much information on Mumia at Bu Jamal, the timeline um, to kind of go um, just that, just to kind of put. Um, because it is, um, let me see, okay, I can use this, uh, thank goodness we can do it. Um, it was, as I said, it was Wesley Cook. He was a high school teacher, um, I'm sorry, a high school teacher in 68, uh, encouraged him to take an African name or an Arabic name for classroom use. So he gave up his name of Wesley Cook and took Mamiya, uh, and Abu Jamal, which means prince. Um, he was involved with the Black Panther Party, he was in New York, living in Oakland for a while. Um, he became a teacher and he worked as a stu uh, student at a former high school. He was suspended for distributing literature calling for black revolutionary student power. Um, every, and again, he was a, a respected journalist. Um, he interviewed people from uh, Bob Marley, Alex Haley, and he was elected president of the Philadelphia Association of Black Journalists. Um, he's also reported on the MOVE organization. Now, I guess I'm going to move, of course, has had several incidents with uh, Frank Rizzo. Um, one, you know, the most, uh, one was when they were living in a house in Palton and there was some, um, a police officer was shot. Um, they were in the basement, I guess they kind of set this up and people forgot. So they're in this house and the police are uh, surrounding it. So a gunfire comes, um, uh, well, a police officer is shot. So they said, well, the bullet came from the basement. And of course, the forensics showed that the bullet came from above. So a police officer friendly fire. And of course, they, they, they brought everybody out, they, they, they brutalized them. And then Frank Rezzo did something which, uh, in order to uh, protect the evidence, he bulldozed the house. Perhaps, as people remember, to, yeah, again, to protect the, um, of course, that's what you do as CSI shows, to a house where you need forensic evidence to show that. He bulldozed it. No, this was, that came later, this was in first. He bulldozed the house, right? And then move, of course, moved to, um, Oh my goodness. Cedar Street. Uh, right, yeah. Osage, Osage, Osage Avenue. Osage. And that's what led to move, eventually moving to Osage Avenue. And of course, at, at that time, Wilson Good was the mayor. Brooks, um, can't think of his first name, was the general manager. Um, and the police was, I think, Greg Sambor. Um, and of course, that led to the uh, May 13th, Mother's Day, 1985, bombing of, of move. Um, and again, we just now, people are, you know, of course, 11. 11, uh, 11 people were killed, five adults, I believe, and six children. Um, they, the, one of the things that a journalist who worked with me proved that, uh, on, that happened on, on a Monday before um, the move, wait a minute, I'm sorry, no, I got, let me go back to that. Um, anyway, that happened on a Sunday. Um, right, it was Monday, Mother's Day, Sunday the 13th. The Daily News the next day, the first edition of the Daily News, remember we had the Daily News and the, uh, the bulletin and the inquiry, so we had three papers, had a picture that the cop, as, the, as the, these five women and six children were trying to get out of this burning house, yeah. they were fired at. Yeah, sure. And they were, and the reason that they had to be forced back into the house. And then the, someone went and told the Daily News, no, you can't print that. Um, and then of course the Daily News came out with another uh, paper later, no mention of that, and of course nobody had. So that was the kind of, you were thinking the police actually you know, killed should have been charged, and of course, no one, no one goes to jail for that. Um, and sad to say that Wilson Good was reelected after that. People forget he went for his second term. Um, so the move incident happens, and um, and and Mumia Abu Jamal reports on this, and um, um, but then comes the the night. Oh, I'm sorry, I take that back. <laughs> he reports on it from prison. Let me go back. Um, it's December the 9th, 1981, in Philadelphia. The intersection of 13th and Locust at 3.55 a.m. Uh, Daniel Faulkner, police officer Daniel Faulkner, conducts a traffic stop on a vehicle belonging to and driven by William Cook, Mumia's brother, younger brother. Faulkner and Cook began engaged in a physical confrontation. Driving his cab in the vicinity, because Abu Jamal was a part-time cab driver, observed the altercation park and ran across the street to walk towards Cook's car, his brother's car. William Faulkner was shot from behind and in the face. He shot at Boo Jamal in the stomach, and Faulkner died at the scene from a gunshot to the head. Of course, the, 
the arrest and trial, um, Boone Jamal had a shoulder holster. He had a revolver which had five spent cartridges was, be, was beside him. And of course, taken to Jefferson Hotel. Um, and as you know, the case went through um, a number of things with, a, with it. Um, one of the things that was interesting that was hit up is that um, Faulkner was shot with a 44 caliber revolver. Um, the gun taken from Amir Abu Jamal was a 38 caliber. Oh. So, and again, that was not um, allowed, or that was not brought up by the, the um, defense attorney at the trial. That was brought out later. Um, and again, after no, I mean, because this, this, that, that trial went on, he was convicted of the death penalty. Um, Governor, was it Tom Wolf? Oh, wait a minute, no. Tom Ridge. Tom Ridge signed <laughs> the death penalty. Thank you, Tom Wolf. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, signed the death, um, the death warrant. Um, and again, because there were so many um, complications and so many, um, uh, you know, it was appealed, went to the state, went to the Supreme Court. Um, they rejected it. The Supreme Court of the United States denied petition a writ, and um, his death warrant was signed in June 1st, 1995 by Pennsylvania Governor Tom Ridge. Um, then it goes up to the Supreme Court. They ruled that all issues raised by Abu Jamal, including the claim of ineffective assistance of counsel, were without merit. Um, and then the, the witnesses started to recant their testimony. They used a number of prostitutes, um, a woman named Cynthia White, and she says, look, they, they gave me a deal. They said if I testify that they saw um, Amir Abu Jamal at that time with a gun um, that she would get, you know, her crime would be there. Um, she later recants her testimony. Then there was, a, in 1999, this is probably one of the, and there's 10 reasons why, that I was given why Mumia was innocent. One of the most damaging or one of the ones that people kind of brought up. In 1999, a man named Arnold Beverly claimed that he and an unarmed assailant, not Mumia Abu Jamal, shot Daniel Faulkner as part of a contract killing because Daniel Faulkner was interfering with graft and payoff to corrupt police. As Abu Jamal's defense team prepared another appeal in 2001, they were divided over use of the Beverly affidavit. Some, some thought it usable and others rejected the story as not credible. Um, so that, and again, that, that goes into the whole thing of who Daniel Faulkner was real quick. Wow. But the idea is, and again, um, Daniel, yeah. so the, the thing was that there was other people who said Daniel Faulkner was an honest cop and a corrupt thing. And then when you don't accept graft and you go back to Serpico, um, it's exactly what happened in New York. It's exactly what happened here. Cops that don't accept graft are considered dangerous to police officers. Um, you know, and again, this, this whole thing about Daniel Falk being, uh, Faulkner being um, an upright cop is, again, something that the police force would not, you know, um, testify. So I, it's, it's one of the things, again, they've never shot it down, but they've never brought it up. So that's one of the things. Um, and, of course, after many um, uh, trials, the, re the recent one, to kind of bring an update, and then I wanted to go to, I guess, questions and answers, um, is that the judge ruled that there was so much... Um, uh, impracticalities and so many uh, biased rulings. That I think the, uh, the jury was all white or 11 white, so it wasn't a jury of his peers. Um, and there were so many misconduct things against Judge Sabo. Um, you know, even the use of the N-word um, when defending that he, Judge Sabo is caught on record as saying that at one point he's tired of all this, he's gonna fry that nigga, um, Jabal. I'm gonna fry. Yeah, he's gonna fry, right. So that, that's on record. And again, all this, again, the Supreme, you know, they, so eventually uh, Abu Jamal wins. Um, uh, they overturn the death penalty, and he is at life imprisonment. Um, so that, and then now Judge uh, Leon Taylor, I believe, has ruled that, um, okay, there's enough uh, misconduct that he deserves a new trial. Um, I wanted to, like, Amnesty International in 2000, um, has, uh, I look for this, this was released in 2000, called The United States of America, Life in the Balance, the case of Mumia Abu-Jamal. Amnesty International, since 2000, has been on the case and is calling for a new trial. And again, this brief, which is online, is really um, uh, February from 2000. So Amnesty International is on record, is also recommending that the retrial take place in a neutral venue where the case has not polarized the public as it has in Philadelphia. And, the, and finally, the authorities should permit prominent jurists from outside the USA to observe the proceedings to ensure that the retrial complies in all respects with universally recognized human rights safeguards. So that's um, uh, this whole thing.